go back into South Bend's history. 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, and what do you see? You see groups of people working to bring change to this city. They had different ideas of what that change should be. They didn't always agree. Yet, in every decade, there were groups of people for whom positive change was their life's work. This podcast, South Bend's Own Words, features the voices of people who helped make the city change. We'll share clips from the oral histories done by the Indiana University South Bend Civil Rights Heritage Center that tell a more complete history of the city. It's the story of many cultures, not just one. It's the story of South Bend. Alma Powell's father left her hometown of Memphis, Tennessee when she was two years old. He was on his way to Flint, Michigan, looking for factory work to support his growing family. He stopped to visit his sister in South Bend when his wife called to say, I'm coming with these three kids. He worked for Studebaker by day and with his family ran Nesbitt's Club and Casino by night. Despite the name, it was a music and a social hall, welcoming local political rallies and conversations, as well as nationally known musicians. There were, as she said, few career paths for an educated young black woman. Teaching was one of them. And Alma's chosen career as an educator and administrator is distinguished. She is the first African-American woman to serve as principal of a South Bend school. As her career grew, so too did pushes to desegregate South Bend's widely disparate school populations. At one point in the late 1960s, one school had a black student population of 99.4%. Others had practically zero. After federal intervention prompted a new wave of drastic change, in the late 1970s, Alma was chosen to lead the South Bend School Corporation's integration efforts. Additionally, she served in leadership roles at her beloved Olivet AME Church, in the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, and during the formative years of the transformation of the natatorium into the Civil Rights Heritage Center. In 2012, Dr. Monica Tetzlaff sat down with Alma Powell. They talked about her growing up and her family's business in the West Side, specifically the lake, as well as her years of leadership, especially as an education administrator. I'm going to start off with some, some easy questions, and I know that um, you look really young, but I'm sorry we have to ask you. Well, we're in good state already, Monica. <laughs> <laughs> We have to ask you when and where you yes. were born. No, not <laughs> when okay, and where I, you were born. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee uh, on July 4th, oh. which is very indicative of my personality, they tell me. And uh, when did you move to uh, this area? I was a ripe old age of two. Uh, my dad came here. And was that in the night? When, what years do you think he worked at Studebaker? Uh, he was most likely there in the um, in the late 40s uh early 50s i can remember i was in high school when he uh retired my parents also had a business out in the mm -hmm. west end of town so while he worked um, at studebaker my mother sort of ran the business from the background of course they hired people but it started out as a as a little cafe uh, oh. on the corner of uh, jefferson and and, and uh, kenmore street just uh, a block off of uh, Western Avenue. I'm not sure exactly when it was, but several years after that, maybe uh, 10 or so, they added on to it, added on to the square footage. And it became known as the Nesbitt's Club Casino. There was no gambling going on, but it was, I don't know where they pulled that name out of the, the sky, but it was Nesbitt's Club Casino. And what it was is they added a large dance hall uh, next door. And uh, people would rent it for for parties, and there were political rallies there. Mm. And uh, but on Friday and Saturday night, there was always a band, 
and uh, so that was our, our that was our major source of, of income in the in the family. Uh, even though he worked at Studebaker, that was still our our major source. And did you work there too when you were a teenager? Um, not you know I was there. You know I can remember. In fact, I can make a mean soda on Sunday today. I know exactly mm-hmm. how it's done. And was that um, a tradition in your family? Had had your grandparents or anyone else um, owned a business or? Um, um, worked uh, as as chefs or yeah um, no no they had uh, in fact my grandmother my father's uh, mother came to live with us for a while here in South Bend which is another interesting part of the, my history is that when they moved here there was no C M E church here there was an A M E African Methodist Episcopal but no colored Methodist Episcopal here at that time so my grandmother along with um, several other people actually started. Uh, the Lehman Chapel Church, and I can even remember them being there uh, in the restaurant and the tavern at the time with planning meetings of, of starting Lehman Chapel. Uh, we've we've uh, researched some uh, some things about the Black Business District on the West Side, and uh, was Nesbitt's Cafe part of uh, um, part of the Black Business District? Where was it located? There was a significant Black Business District out in that uh, the South Park area, which is the extreme west side of the mm-hmm. area. So it was really a, a community that uh, gelled together, a community that could very well live together, uh, get along out there, exchange. You know, there was a place to get your your drugstore items from the pharmacy. There was a place for entertainment for the family to come. I remember we had a jukebox that that was there. So uh, we were pretty much uh, self-contained in that community. And I can remember also my dad uh, on occasion, you know, helping some of the families out in that area who uh, had would come up on a short-term uh, hard time. And uh, probably some of that compassion that I hope still lives within me mm-hmm. is seeing that compassion that came out of my mother and father as a result of listening to the stories of the, the people in the community. And uh, we, were, we weren't any different from anyone else. No one was any different from anyone else in that community. We were all uh, there in the same boat. We were all uh, African-Americans, all Negroes, all, all black people that were there and, and treated the same once we went up on Western Avenue. So none of us were, were any better than anyone else, even though some of our revenue and, and income may have been uh, at a higher level. Some of us had, some of the parents had good jobs, some did not. Um, knowing that sometimes you would en- encounter racism in your life, was there anything that your parents um, told you to kind of prepare you um, and to uh, uh, instill self-esteem mm-hmm. in you and mm-hmm. and to uh, well, uh, in terms of preparation for for race by my parents, uh, their story was always real simple. In fact, my, my it was mainly my mother's story, and that was I mean it was just real simple. You always have to be better. Uh, that if you're writing a paper, if you're doing something for class, you've got to study harder than they do, and they mean white. Uh, if you if you're in an, an athletic event, uh, you you have to try a little harder. You you have to always be better. Uh, and and that was it. I, it wasn't any broader than that. What were you like as a as a child in school? Did you enjoy school? Um, how did it how did it seem yeah. to you? Oh, I loved school and more than anything else I loved to read. And we had a library up on Western Avenue that, you know, I'd get a bag and walk up there. You couldn't do that now, you know, because it was probably a mile away from home. It was there in the Mary Crest area. I lived about thirty four hundred block uh uh Western Avenue and that was probably oh maybe even in the sixteen, seventeen hundred block there. So I'd walk up to the library and, and get books. And I had these very genres. I can remember, you know, I was on the mythology genre. I was on the, the teen club genre. I was, you know, it was just, you know, whatever I was in love with at that certain time. So I was a, a type of student that liked to read. Um, I um, had a fourth grade teacher, Alma Vukovitz, who inspired me to be a teacher. I don't know if I love Miss Vukovitz because her name was Alma or whether mm-hmm. she uh, she treated me special, I think. Well, of course, I went to Harrison, Harrison Elementary, out on Western Avenue. That was a K-8 then. Uh, went to Washington High School, started the old Washington that no longer exists over in Sample. Uh, I think when I by the time I got to Washington High School, I had 
some of the um, the spirit of civil rights in me, and so I question things uh, readily and easily, uh, as I do today. Uh, so we finished, in, in, I finished in '61. Uh, what I did was came out here to Indiana University, well, to Indiana University South Bend, uh, the North Side campus had just been built, and um, went uh, matriculated here. And then uh, in January, went to Bloomington. And uh, that's sort of where my education went. I stayed down in Bloomington uh, for two years, for a year and a half. My mother became very ill. And so I came back and had finished at uh, Indiana University South Bend. Uh, when, as soon as I finished, I started teaching. Uh, then decided right away. I had this friend that went here with me. And she said, oh, let's get our master's. And I was t so tired of school. But Doris made me go and get my master's. And I was interested in administration at that time. And I had to go back down to Bloomington. So I spent several summers uh, in Bloomington because at that time, you could not get your administrative certification here on this campus. My college experience at IU was interesting because uh, there was a lady in our neighborhood, Miss um, Jarrett, that everyone loved and, and revered so. And she had gone down to IU uh, years ago when black students could not stay on campus. And so I had privilege to hearing some of those stories. Uh, when I arrived down there uh, in January, which was an odd time, uh, so I sort of went with these ideas of what things were, were sort of like there. Uh, I had been advised to not go into town uh, by myself, you know, because again, that was the 60s and it was Southern Indiana. Uh, there were stories that were alive and well about the, the black, young black man who's never been found since then mm -hmm. that disappeared in Martinsville uh, as he was coming through. So I went down with, with some of that, that type of thing in my head. But I was uh, the first debutante that come out, came out of uh, South Bend, uh, the Alpha Cap Alpha. So I could go no other way. Uh, this woman that I spoke of earlier that had been on campus when, when blacks couldn't live on campus, uh, Miss Jarrett was sort of a, a mentor for me with Alpha Cap Alpha sorority and, and all. So. But it was, um, it was a decent experience. Uh, very small group of um, African Americans. We were a very tight group. You have to understand my, my age, which you know, and generation. Um, we were very limited in terms of what we as black women could go into and look for success. I always tell everyone, my mother wanted me to be a nurse. My dad wanted me to be a teacher. My dad came from a family of, of teachers. Some of his, um, he had an aunt that was a teacher, and so it was just a, a sort of uh, community of educators. And so I can probably pretty much say that I would have already uh, always wanted to be a teacher. I can't remember ever wanting to be anything else. And so I, I just loved, you know, being a, in, in this community mm -hmm. and having been an educator. And I, I love the field and having that impact, I think, on, on the lives. See, my, my philosophy is we have to teach kids in spite of. In fact, I was reading something, you know, I, I think about what's going on at Washington and Riley and Bendix. And our kids do come from some, uh, sometimes some very low socioeconomic areas. They come from some uh, very trying and trial homes where, where parents have problems, they have issues. And, you know, it's difficult for them to, they can't, you know, the last thing in their mind is reading to a child at night when they're trying to get some food on the table for the kid or just trying to satisfy their needs for addiction or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I, and my philosophy is when I teach a class here at IU, I always say our responsibility is to teach kids in spite of and to, to stop this generation of kids who have, of a family who's dropped out of school or stop the generation of families who have had out of wedlock births or stop this generation of people who are, are dropouts. We need to teach these kids in spite of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, made um, assistant principal at Central Middle School. Oxymoron on top of oxymoron, Central Middle School. Mm -hmm. What it was was a holding ground for uh, kids until they built two new schools, Brown and Dickinson. And so what they did at Central was they brought seventh and eighth grade in from inner city, and they came from schools that were 80, 90% African-American. 
And then they brought in all ninth grade, all ninth grade kids, and that inner town went there. So they brought in a white population from German Township, Ardmore, and all in there. So here these black kids were, and these white kids were, that had never gone to school before with black and white kids. And here I was the savior, right? Because I could save everyone because I was 26, 27 years old, and I thought I had all the answers, right? Uh, I was in my um, office one day, which was an oxymoron at that, too. But uh, this, this white girl came in and asked, could she use my phone? And I thought, I could tell something about her face, and I could tell, okay, I should say yes. I shouldn't, you know, give her the, you know, the, the questionnaire. So I said, sure, sweetie, you can use the phone. She called her mother and said, Mom, did you know that there are real tall buildings down here? There's a building that goes all the way up in the sky. That child had not been into inner city South Bend. And so, I, and I tell that story to say, this is the conglomerate that was mixing there at that school. So uh, I worked there as assistant principal. Again, I lose track of times for about four, about four years. And that's when the federal government came and told South Bend schools that they had to desegregate the schools. Uh, they, they wanted to float a bond to build a new school. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll support you in that if you get rid of some of these segregated buildings. And so I was on a committee that was working on the desegregation plan. Uh, it was difficult. It, it was because a lot of people didn't want it. Mm -hmm. And when you say a lot of people, people think it was white people, but it was white people and black people who did not want redistricting. We had this thing called the hotline, and people called in the hotline and cussed us out on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, there, I think, but you know what? I'm going to tell you the attitude I took with, with opposition, and I, and I think it's so true, and I still believe it today, that the opposition was fear of the unknown. Because people who were in an all-black setting or an all-white setting were afraid of going in a mixed setting. And so uh, any parents that were safe from out in Clay or wherever that were afraid for their kids coming in, it was fear because it was fear of the unknown. Because so much of it is based on, on stereotype and what we think. Uh, so that was part of my philosophy of that, is just getting people to get rid of that fear of the unknown. that That's what it was about. Uh, I don't think it was so much, well, there could have been some prejudice, you know, stuff in there. But I think prejudice is fear too. So that's where I felt like the, the I wanted to have impact, is to have people see the value of a diverse society. One of the things I used to do uh, was talk to people that came in, like from Memorial Hospital, that they were bringing a doctor in and trying to sell him or her on the values of our community. Uh, I love talking to people who like diversity because and a lot of people who were high level professionals want their kids to grow up in a diverse environment because they know their kids can make it in, in any setting. Mm -hmm. But I feel like any kid from South Bend Community School Corporation or a school corporation that's integrated will not have difficulty going and working anywhere in this, in this nation and getting along with people and knowing about people and having a sincere sort of feeling. So. I, when I look back on my educational experiences and think about where the greatest impact was, I, I, I like to think that it was uh, having that whole integration piece. And a lot of things that, that we did uh, out of that office that I worked in, in preparation with, with teachers and with, with kids and with uh, families, we brought students in and spent weekends with them, uh, diverse student groups, so they could get to know each other. And that's the way I feel about the natatorium. I wouldn't want the wrecking ball to have been taken to uh, Lorraine Hotel, and I don't want it to go to the natatorium because I think it serves as a, a place where we can teach kids uh, about the importance of, of being uh, spokespeople, how they can change uh, wrongs and, and make them right. Uh, here's an example of how some people that look like you, some people that didn't look like you, uh, change things because it was not just a black thing or a white thing. It was a diverse group of people who worked on that project together. And there's so many people in our community that are the unsung heroes. And I hate to sound, use that cliche type term, but here's a place for them to go and, and read about the, the Wills and uh, the Carters and, and uh, the Jesse Dickinsons and uh, even the, the Emma Nesbitts who started a CME church here for them to go and uh, to learn about how people like them uh, in their community had, you know, had a feeling for this community and wanted to be better. So uh, I'm really excited about the project.
South Bend's Own Words was created by Kevin Tidmarsh and me, George Garner. This episode was produced by Natalie Villalobos and by me through the Indiana University South Bend Civil Rights Heritage Center. Visit us and learn how IU South Bend students inspired the transformation of a once segregated South Bend swimming pool. We give guided tours and offer public events that show how the history of oppression echoes through the city today. See and hear more history, plan your visit, or share your thoughts about this episode, all at crhc.iusb.edu.